Hello. Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> Just mic check, music check. Is everything going okay? <laughs> Am I live? Is this working? Yes, yes, lovely. Hello, hello Shari, nice to see you again. So, um, I don't know how many people we've got live watching at the moment. Um, hello, welcome to a Millinery Studio live stream. My name is Ilona, I'm a milliner based in London and today we're going to carry on where we left off from last week's live stream. Last week, what did we do last week? We should go over what we did last week. We blocked this crown. Now it's off the block at the moment um, because I needed to use that block for another hat that I'm working on. So I did take it off the block and I cut it neatly along the edge. And I don't know if you, can, if you guys can remember, this was a normal crown block that had this pointy tip stuck to it which we stuck on with masking tape and then covered the whole thing in cling film and then we blocked this in a black a uh, black wool felt sorry I shall take a sip of tea hmm I've got a dry throat today hi Rachel nice to see you uh, we've got Matthew and Labrica Luce, Rachel, in the chat as the moderators, so they can post links and answer questions, and I can answer your questions too. If you've got any questions, post them in the chat, and I will do my best to not miss them and respond to them. Um, we've gone through the pointy tip crown. Let's visit what we did with the ring block. Do you guys remember the ring block from last week that I really struggled putting the buckram around? This is the ring block, still covered in the cling film. And this is what the buckram looks like taken off the ring block. Now I've done things to it. This is buckram covered in Demet. Let me switch the camera view. There we go. This is the buckram. You can see the buckram on the inside if I unfold it. Hi Michael, nice to see you. So, this is the buckram, and then on the outside, I've got it covered in a layer of Demet. And also, I've put a wire in. If I fold the buckram, uh, if I fold Demet back, you can see the buckram. Um, oh dear, words escape me today. <laughs> I've got the wire in here attached to the buckram with the demet over the top and I haven't quite finished this. What I plan to do is to stitch the demet down over the wire and then stitch shut the opening from the ring block ending up with a perfect tube in a ring shape and if I put it on my head this is what it looks like. It's like a little a nice little halo. What do you guys think? Do you like it? I think it's very pretty. What do you guys think? Let me know in the chat. And I plan to cover this in a rose, a very delicate rose coloured silk velvet. Also, which will be cut on the bias. And I don't know if I'm going to do that on the stream or not, but this is, this is going in the cupboard of the things on the to-do list to do later on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, it is beautiful. I, I really like this. Um, I'm, I've got to think of other things to do with this ring block now that I have it. I've kind of run out of ideas. I was hoping that I would take this off the block and then I could twist it into forms and shapes and do weird things and nothing really inspired me. So I've just ended up with it as a plain donut ring. But um, we'll see. We'll see what happens to it. I'm going to put this to one side. While we're still waiting for people to join, do you guys want to see a... <laughs> uh, in the US it's called, uh, Demet is called Ice Wall or Ice Wall. I think you're right, Rachel. 
Um, so Rachel says, I believe in the US we call Demet ice wool or ice wool. I think, I think I have heard this before and I may have even read it in some American millinery manuals, so I think you're right. Um, hey, hi Sarah. Um, we were just going to preview some hats that I've been working on. Do you guys want to see a preview? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's start with what's in the shot. This is in the shot. <laughs> Look at this, guys. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> this took me such a long time. There's a video coming on this. Um, this is a freeform trilby crown and a... I guess you could call it a bucket brim, I'm not really sure. Um, but this is made on a self-made cardboard block. Now, if if all goes to plan, this will be the next video. But um, we'll, we'll put it under the table for now because it's not quite ready. <laughs> and then the second preview, I have been working on this for a few weeks now because I'm making this hat in lots of delicious colours. <laughs> I love these. What I really like about these is they're really easy to make. I'll just pop one on. And the way, I, I mean, you can wear it any way you like, but I like to wear these slightly covering the eyebrows. I think it's kind of a bit like, ooh, coquettish. <laughs> this is made out of cinnamé and this is the same shape made in cinnamé. I've got a pink one and a coral one behind the camera that haven't yet been put together. So for now it's just these two. The special thing about these, um, apart from the fact that it's cinnamé on the bias, which is obviously very special, but the very special thing about these is that the colour of all of the hats that I've made is the, um, is from the Pantone Colours of the Year. So if you don't know, this year in 2022, um, Pantone's Colour of the Year is Berry Perry, which is a periwinkle colour. Um, I'll talk more about it in the video to come. I shouldn't reveal too much, otherwise you'll all watch the same information twice. So I'm just, I'm, I'm not going to talk about it anymore, but this is Berry Perry, it's Pantone's Colour of the Year, and we'll talk about the pros and cons of this colour in that video. I hope I've intrigued you guys enough. <laughs> Hi Angeles! Thanks everyone for your lovely compliments on the hats. That's the preview done. Um, how is everyone? <laughs> I feel like I started very abruptly and I didn't quite organise myself well enough. So hello, hello everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, how are you all? What are you all drinking? Where are you Where are you tuning in from? I am, as usual, still in London. Uh, it's four o'clock for me, so I'm drinking tea, and it's caffeinated tea today, so I should be buzzing in about 20 minutes. From Singapore, also drinking tea. Hello, Singapore. <laughs> Feel a bit like Eurovision when I ask these questions. <laughs> Sarah, you're busy hatting, obviously, of course. <laughs> Rachel, mid mid morning for you, so just water, not coffee today. <laughs> drinking apple juice in Austria. That feels very apt, I think, because um, Austria, apple strudel comes from Austria, I think, right? So apple juice, apple strudel. Living room with my coffee and a fire. That sounds absolutely lovely. That sounds like where I want to be right now. I'm actually a little bit cold because I turned the heating off before the stream because I thought we'll be blocking with steam and it will get very, very hot. But because I have not turned the steamer on yet, I'm actually really, really cold and my fingers are really cold. <laughs> um, so because I'm so cold, maybe we should start blocking now. So let me, um, let me get my steamer out and let me get the first block. <laughs> uh, where did the steamer go? The steamer's here. 
Here is my steamer. If you're not familiar with it, it's just a cheap steamer off of Amazon that is a clothes steamer. So you can, they're very readily available. <laughs> and the block. Here's the cape clean. And here's the first block. So uh, if I just pop it on my head, we'll talk about this block first and, and then we'll block a bit. So this block, I would think of it as being worn kind of like this. This is an upturned brim. And if you wear it on an angle, I think it looks really lovely. So I hope everyone can see that. This is a good tip for if you're trying to choose a block in a block maker shop and you're not sure exactly how it's going to look, just pop it on your head. Um, you should be able to tell which way up it goes. Um, so the curves, depending on if it's an upward curve or a downward curve, it's generally quite easy to tell. So this way around for this one. Um, it will, most of them should have front and back marks. So if I just switch the camera views. There we go. So this one's got, I think this is the back mark. There's a little groove in here on the inside, which is the front. Um, there's nothing much really to say. Oh, actually, no, there is. The other thing to say about blocks like this is that you'll notice there's some, some holes in the bottom. Now, ideally, it would have a little, like two little legs that it stands on. They're just kind of wood leg things and you just pop it on there and it should stand upright like this and that makes it easier to pull wool felt over the top of it but I don't have anything like that so instead of the proper brim block stand I've got a couple of hat boxes <laughs> here they are and I'm going to put this block onto the hat boxes, uh, hat boxes to prop it up a little bit. So I'm going to just pop it like this and hopefully I have enough space around it to pull things over the top. Um, the other thing to think about with a block like this make sure you can all see it is it's kind of blocking the wrong side up so this is the cape plane um, if you remember from the last live stream we did this little cap uh, crown with the pointy tip this is from this cape plane and it will go this was technically the right side and because this is standing up like this, this lip, I would turn it over and do it kind of upside down and the other way around. I hope that will make, I hope that will make sense once we actually get started. So I'm going to turn on the steamer. Yep, that's going to heat up. And the other thing I've got prepped for steaming this cake thing. Oh, it's going to get noisy in a second. I've got a whole bunch of towels here. Now, the thing with the towels is, if I had a bigger steamer, I possibly wouldn't need the towel, but I want the steam to be able to penetrate the wool felt much faster than just, you know, if I was to just sit there with the steamer steaming it, that would take ages. So what I'm going to do is take the towel and put half of it on the table under the steamer And then switch the camera view so you can see the front. Like that, yep. So this is the steamer. Here's that towel. And then I'm going to take this and try and cuddle it with the towel. Like this. So Hopefully, hopefully that will trap the steam and hold it in. 
Something I was thinking of trying is maybe doing the same thing, but with like a, a plastic bag or tin foil, but I'm not sure if a plastic bag would melt from the steam, so I, I don't really want to try that. But I have a feeling that if I then covered it in tin foil, that would also hold it, hold the steam in. Good morning, Aisha. Right. I've got a second towel, so I might as well cover it with the second towel. And I mean, that's that's got to keep going now for about 20 minutes because wool felt takes a lot of steam. While that's going, we need to cover this in cling film. Here's the cling film, the same one from last week, the awful cling film that doesn't stick to anything and it doesn't stick to itself, but I need to use it up. <laughs> ah, Rachel, you say you've done, you've done the trick with the grocery bags and they don't melt, I'm guessing. I mean, it's probably grocery bag dependent, but that, that fills me with a bit more hope than maybe it will work. <laughs> Something to try for next time. Right, I'm gonna start unfurling the cling film. I think the best way to wrap this particular block is to probably go around it several times and through like this. Oh, that's going to sound very funny on the microphone. I do apologize. Do tell me if the cling film sounds are too squeaky. So I'm just gonna go around it, around and around. Oops. Through the middle. And ideally I wouldn't have a lot of creases in this. Ah, Rachel, uh, you say you did a time-lapse video of blocking on a puzzle block using a plastic bag to make a steam chamber. Well, that sounds interesting. Maybe you could link to that for everyone in the chat and then um, uh, they can see it afterwards. I wonder if this is going to give me too many creases, but I can't think of a better way of doing this. Ah, yes, I see, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, um, Traina? <coughs> oh, excuse me. Traina, having problem with cling film, yes. It's just, sometimes you don't know what you're buying with cling film and you just get unlucky and then you can't just not use it because that would be so wasteful and so you end up using bad cling film and just hoping that at some point that roll will end. Ha, huh, Sarah, you say you wrap also. Do you do you find that you get um, place, um, problems with the creases? It, do they ever show through to the felt? If you're curious what I'm doing, I'm using my nails to poke, to poke through. I don't know where I put my scissors. I don't know if you joined us last week, um, Traina. We, we did have a cling film discussion and we came to the conclusion that potentially we could try cling film from um, like food industry suppliers because that should potentially be a better quality one. Right, I'm going to check. Let's check on the, on the cake lean. Oh, all that steam. <laughs> you saw it go. Oh, it's hot. Okay, I'm going to flip it round so it was on this side, now I'm going to put this side in. Uh, Michael says, I wonder if press and seal would work better. I don't know what that is. Um, yes, Traina, the stuff from like baking shops and like professional food grade stuff we thought might work better. Well, okay, that's still going. The cling film is done. I should get out my pins. I'll show you my pins. I think I've discovered the best pins ever. 
It's these little black pins. And they're from a brand called Prim. And they are really, really good. They don't rust. Is that in focus? I think that, I hope that's in focus. But yeah, these pins, they just don't rust. They're so good. And they're thick enough that they don't break, but also thin enough that they're not gonna leave massive giant holes in, in the wood or whatever you're using. Oh, that sounds like my steamer is running out of steam. No, still got some. Okay. Uh, and as well as the pins, obviously, I have got loads of thimbles. I still haven't found my preferred thimble, so I have an open an open top tailor's thimble on my for my thumb, and then I've got these two things, which I think are called like finger armor thimbles. And the reason I use these is because I like to have long nails. They're a bit short at the moment, but they um, they accommodate for the long nail lengths. Uh, Shari says rusting must be a problem with so much steam. It can be if you're using bad quality pins. So this is why I really like these black ones from Prim. Um, maybe what I can do is I will look up where I bought them and I'll post a link later under the stream so you can have a look at exactly which ones they are. Oops, I need to add more steam to the steamer. Oh, it's all very warm. We've been chatting away and it's got very hot now. Luckily I'm prepared with water next to me. I want to be very careful when pouring the water into the steamer. Because I have had people say to me, oh, I've tried the steamer that you have and it spits water. And the steamer will spit water if you fill it above the maximum line. So you've got to be very careful. You don't want the steamer spitting. All right, pop that back on. Oh, it definitely needs more steam. Not quite steamed through yet. Um, yes, back to the pins. So I can't quite remember exactly which pins cause the rusting, but it can happen, especially on lighter, um, on lighter coloured felt, so you won't really see it as a problem on dark blues, navies, anything like that, but white felt. And actually, to be honest, on white felt, I've also, I have had problems with these actually rusting as well. But just, I think the moral of the story is don't leave the pins in for too long, I think, maybe, I don't know. I, I really want to explore what type of pins cause rust and what conditions cause the rust and also some things that we can do to take the rust off from hats because I have been experimenting with um, with a few things and so far I think I discovered that isopropyl alcohol can get rid of um, pin marks and also um, white spirit vinegar but I haven't confirmed that so I've just said it so that you can all experiment but it's not um, a confirmed solution to the problem. Uh, Michael says, Press and Seal is a cling film kind of product. It's got a smooth side that would go against the block and then the other side is kind of sticky so it sticks to itself. I still have no idea what Press and Seal is. It must be, it must be an American thing. There are plenty of experiment videos planned for the new year. The problem with experiment videos is that they take a lot of time to do because especially the rust one, it's it's about setting up all the conditions of the experiment and then like leaving it for a couple of months to see what happens over a long distance of time. <laughs> so I, I do I do want to do it. Right, what else have I got for the blocking? I've got some blocking cords because this block can you see here it has a groove in it so this is the groove in the block I will be pulling a string around it in fact I should check that this string will make it all the way around it oh just about makes it uh, 
uh, Trainia says, have you considered live stream or blocking with other things? Ooh, what, what kind of other things are you thinking? You mean things that aren't um, hat blocks? Do you have some suggestions? Okay, this, this should work, this string, hopefully. If not, I've got some cord with me and we can make a super long blocking cord. I've got my giant, I call this my master pin. This is what holds my blocking string in place. It's this giant, giant pin with a giant pin head that's easy to push through lots of things. Right, this sounds, ooh. Oh, so much steam. So much steam. It's it's getting there, it's still not quite there. Goodness, I think this has been going now for at least 15 minutes. The towel, I feel like the towel can be blocked. It's very steamy and stretchy, but the wool felt still needs more time. This might be one of those cases where I'll need to spray the wool felt with some water just to get it going. Um, Yes, stuff like styrofoam and plates, flower pots and plates. Yes, I do actually have a flower pot somewhere in this room. I don't know where it's gone. Um, I went to a garden center to buy a Christmas tree before Christmas and I stumbled across this plant pot and it looked, it looked like, a, like a, it could be like a, a fez shape with, with nice curves in it. And I thought, oh, that would look really lovely in a red felt and a buckle trim, a giant buckle trim. So this is on my list of things to do. Um, but first I do want to block on these wooden blocks because I've actually never blocked on this particular block before. Um, this is an antique vintage block that I bought online and I have been, I've really been waiting to use it and this is, this is the first time I'm using it today. <laughs> Live with you guys all here watching and it's going to turn out that I don't know what I'm doing again, just like last week with the ring block. Sounds like it's running out of steam again. No, it's still got some. Right, um, almost ready. That's almost ready. I'm almost ready. I've got my pins and my thimbles. I'm going to, what I like to do when blocking is to just take all these pins out of, I don't know if you can see that on the table there, but I like to take the pins out of everything and it, it is a mess on the table. If I just move the camera slightly, whee, no, that's not gonna work. Okay, well, there is a mess of pins on the table rather than keeping them neat in the bag. Um, before blocking, I'm also going to put on my lab coat. Now, you obviously, you can just wear an apron, but I prefer to wear a lab coat because they're a bit thicker than just your average kitchen aprons. And also, my granddad has a lab coat, and I miss my granddad, he's all the way in Russia, so I wear a lab coat and I feel slightly closer to him. My granddad is a water engineer, so that's why he's got a lab coat, but he's retired now, so he uses his lab coat as a bathrobe, which I think is a really, really good idea. Okay, I think we're getting there. I'm, I'm going to spray the inside with some, with some water. I should really switch the camera view. There we go. So, I, I don't always like to spray the wool felts because you never know exactly how they're going to react. Because I had this wool felt once and it was this lovely, light brown kind of chocolatey mouse color with like a a tiny hint of warmth with slight some slight pinkiness to it and i sprayed it with water on the inside because it just wasn't stretching over the block and i don't know why but when it dried it had like a watermark on the tip where i'd obviously saturated the most of the water so i'm i'm very paranoid about spraying things with water because i don't want to ruin them my hope is that this is black and so nothing should really show up if there was a watermark or anything like that. Right. Have I got space on the table? <laughs> Is that? Oh my goodness, it's still really stiff. 
see if this was, this needs more water, if that was a fur felt, it would be so much easier. More steam. I might be tempted to go and get a plastic bag out because this is taking just so long. Aisha says I'm taking a wet felting course to make my own felt hats. Wow, that's that is the next level of the skill set. I I don't really know much about felting or anything like that. I I can imagine it's probably very difficult, time consuming, and probably very hard on the hands as well. All that water, and I think you use soap to mix it all up? I don't know. I, I have vague memories of doing some wel wet felting in an art class when I was in primary school at the age of like nine or ten. <laughs> but I, I don't really know much about it myself. <laughs> Aha! The Haberdashery Project! Hello Wayne, nice to see you. Thanks for joining me. Yes, a heavy plastic bag works so much better. I might have to go and get a plastic bag. Give me one second. I will, I will, I have a new video thing. I shall turn on the intermission music while I go and find a plastic bag. everyone I'm back <laughs> who recognized the music <laughs> um, right I have some plastic bag options here which are going to play havoc with the microphone and I have already woken up the cat by shaking them out but I have this thin one um, and then I've also got this thick IKEA bag the iconic blue IKEA shopping bag um, because it's much thicker I'm tempted to try the thinner one first because I have a feeling the IKEA one is slightly perforated. Um, so I guess let's try that. So I guess, oh, I'm so sorry for the microphone. I guess I'll just bundle it in and then kind of almost like a, um, you know, this reminds me of those 1950s hairdryer hoods when you're at the hairdressers. Oh, Ikea is better. Okay, Ikea is better. Let's do Ikea. Thank you for your tips. <laughs> oh yes, I can already feel that disintegrating actually. Yes, let's try the Ikea. It's a giant Ikea bag. But let's see. Hopefully, oh, it's slightly dirty on the inside. I'm going to turn it inside out. Maybe I should turn the microphone off for a second. Drusilla, my kitten is not enjoying the plastic bag sounds. sitting with me out of camera view I'm afraid. 
I did have a complaint last time that Drusilla did not appear in the stream. So maybe Drusilla will make an appearance later. Yes, darling? Will you make an appearance later? She says maybe. Right, okay. For those of us just joining, we are battling with a wool felt capelin, trying to get it saturated in enough steam to block it on an upturned brim block. Um, and I've currently got it bundled up in this blue plastic bag, which is an IKEA bag. Um, and hopefully that will trap enough steam. I think it's working a bit better than the towel. Maybe if I then put the towel over the top as well. Oh, people want to see Drusilla. Drusilla, are you awake enough? Come and say hello. Come and say hello, Drusilla. Come on. Okay, I'm going to have to pop around and get her from the other side. Drusilla. Drusilla, hello. <laughs> oh, this is Drusilla. <laughs> oh, I have disturbed her slumber. Sorry, girlie. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There she is. We match today with my white lab coat and her lovely white belly. <laughs> okay, I'm going to let her go because I've got steam on the table. <laughs> Oh, she's coned because she had her spay operation, but she has almost fully recovered and only got three days of the cone left. Oh, the steam is hot. The steam is very hot. Oh, she found a plastic bag. Husband, could you come and get the plastic bag away from the cat, please? Okay, this is very hot. I'm going to turn the steamer off at the wall plug so that it calms down and then I'll reach in and get the uh, get the cake clean. It's hopefully definitely hot enough now. Oh, all that steam. Oh, that looks much better. Right, I think it's time to try and pull it over the block. So, I guess, time to switch camera views. There we go, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, I shall top up my steamer before we start because I'm convinced I'm definitely going to need more steam on this wool felt. Okay, let's see if this is going to work. So, first off, this inside bit needs to reach into into this inside lip and I'm going to need to put in, do you know what? Here are all my blocking things. I'm going to use a pin pusher instead of thimbles today. So with the pin pusher you pop the pin in and then you find where it needs to go and literally just push it in. Oh, this is going to be very difficult to film well. So I'm going to push it against my stomach. Eep. Did that go in? That went in. So this is why you want to wear a lab coat or a, a thing, uh, an apron or something like that, because you want to be able to... Ah, I'm worried this isn't going to work now. Uh, didn't finish that sentence. Because you want to be able to not worry about getting any dyes on your clothes. But I think this isn't going to work because the opening is too wide. I was hoping I'd be able to shrink it in. Uh, it's not a vintage pin pusher. It can be found online. Once again, I can put a link to the one I have in the description box below. Mm. Um, 
I think you can find them with various brands, but this is just a really nice wooden handled one. Do you know what guys, I don't think this is going to work because I think there's too much of an opening. Well, that's annoying. You see, if I had this cape clean that still had the top of it on, I should have potentially blocked the brim first and then used the leftovers to block the crown, but obviously I didn't think ahead. Hmm. Is that going to work? Is that going to shrink? I was kind of hoping that for some reason the felt would just magically um, just shrink, but I, I don't think it's going to. There's just so much space there. I don't know why there's so much space. Will it fit? Part of me is thinking the more I fiddle, the more it should try and fit in, but I really don't think this is going to work. Okay, well that's a fail then. Yeah, no, I don't know. Can you guys see on that camera, on the black bit, there's just so much excess. I mean, I could block a brim that has like a pleat in it. That would work, but I don't want to do that on this block. Never mind. All that steaming for nothing. That's okay. Sometimes, I guess this is a lesson of sometimes things just don't go to plan. <laughs> so, no matter how much I plan and think things are gonna work in my head, sometimes things just don't. So that's slightly disappointing. Can I get this pin out again? <laughs> this is the problem with pin pushers, is once you put the pin in, it's really difficult to get it out because the pin pusher really, <laughs> really gets stuck in there. So I'm gonna use some pliers and just pull it out. There it is. Ah, oh, never mind. Yes, thanks Wayne. Not a fail, it's a learning experience. I mean, that is, that is a very kind way of putting it. <laughs> Um, Matthew says, I think it looks bigger than before you steamed it. Potentially, it could have just expanded and relaxed in the steamer. Um, oh, I don't know what OOT means, but um, uh, do you have any affordable display ideas for fascinators? I'm planning to sell them and I don't want to terrify others with a styrofoam head. Uh, yes, that is a topic for another stream. We're not going to talk about display ideas today, but just quickly to answer your question. Um, you can cover a styrofoam head in paper mache strips of newspaper and paint it using acrylic paints or wall emulsion paints. And, oh, out of topic. Oh, I see. Yes. OOT means out of topic. Right. Um, I might be young, but I don't know the internet lingo. <laughs> um, yes. So get your styrofoam head, get some strips of newspaper, long strips of newspaper. Um, some PVA glue, water it down, do a paper mache coating of maybe two or three layers, let each layer dry in between, paint it with some primer, then some paint. I actually like to use wall emulsions, so the, the kind of paint that you paint walls with over these things, because I think it just goes on better. Um, and then you have a head that looks not styrofoam. Um, anyway, um, should we get back to blocking? Um, yeah, this is, do, do you think it looks bigger? It does, doesn't it? Because the, let me get the cap back out. I keep calling it the cap. It's not the cap, it's the crown, the pointy tip crown. And incidentally, just before I took it off the block, I did mark my front and back using some pins, front and back. So always make sure you mark. And if I just pop that on my head, it's slightly bigger than my head. So this is now, I can wear it like a collar. So yes, it has definitely stretched. That's such a shame, but never mind. I'll find a different use for it. I can cut it up and make tiny Kello half hats out of it. I don't have to use it as a brim. Oh well, next time I'll just get a full cape clean, block the, uh, or maybe even get a cape clean, uh, two cape cleans block the brim out of one and the crown out of another, which is what I've heard the majority of people do. But I was trying to see if I could save materials and just do one hat out of one cape clean and it doesn't look like that's potentially possible with this kind of block. That's a shame. Never mind. I'm going to um, 
pop the intermission on and change the stuff on the table and we'll move on to puzzle blocks which was going to be the final culmination of this um, stream but we've reached there sooner than planned because things went wrong so um, let's have a two minute tea break teas, coffees, wines, gin and tonics whatever you're drinking depending on your time of day and I'll see you in two minutes Welcome back, everybody. I don't know how many people are, I don't know if that was two minutes, that felt like less than two minutes, but it was enough time for me to switch things over. Um, so before starting on this, I will give it maybe one more minute just to make sure people are back. Um, hopefully the music and audio is still all good and everything is working. Uh, while we were away, um, oh, thanks for your support, everyone, with the, with the things going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, sometimes it happens. I do, I do sometimes get upset when things don't go to plan, so I'm trying really hard to not get too upset because, as, as you will say, it's a learning experience. And actually, throughout my millinery journey, as I like to call it, a lot of things, a lot of the time, a lot of things have gone wrong. And I almost wish that I'd kept a lot of the things that have gone wrong so that I could share it with you guys, but I had a giant clear out in my flat uh, like two years ago and I got rid of a lot of stuff that had gone wrong because I couldn't see any way of improving it so I didn't want to hold on to it but now I wish I'd kept it so I could show you um, one of the examples that comes to mind was I made a um, I tried to make a 1930s style cartwheel hat out of a um, one of those paper paper cape cleans um, but it wasn't a paper capelin that I bought from a millinery shop, it was a paper capelin that I had from like a, an accessory shop like Accessorize or Monsoon or one of those kind of high street accessory ones. And I thought, oh, I'll cut the top off, cut down the crown, stitch it together, and that worked fine. But then I had the problem with the ring too, too, um, too floppy, and I hadn't 
pretty much done any millinery at that time and of course it didn't occur to me to just put a wire in the edge and I thought, oh, I should stiffen it with something. What do I have that would stiffen paper? Oh, I know, glue, <laughs> PVA glue. So I just submerged the entire cake clean in PVA glue and then I thought, oh, this, this feels fine. And then it dried and it was rock solid. Like, um, you could, you could probably, if you flung it like a frisbee, you could take someone out with it, like odd job from James Bond. It was, it was really horrific. Um, so I've learnt from that to not over stiffen things because it's much easier to add stiffener than take it away. So, um, that was another fail that I had. <laughs> oh well, we move on. So, um, hopefully everyone is back. Um, and here is, here is the puzzle block. <laughs> I don't know if all of you know what a puzzle block is. If I take it off the stand, let's switch the videos. Yes, PVA glue nightmares. I do want to do a video on um, types of PVA glue because believe it or not, there are two types of PVA glue and I don't want to go into it in too much detail right now, but there's polyvinyl alcohol glue and then there's polyvinyl acetate glue and they're both different. They have different properties um, and they're used for different things. One is water soluble, one isn't water soluble, but anyway, I, I'll get into that in that video that is coming at some point this year. <laughs> I get very easily distracted. Today is one of those days. Um, so here is what the puzzle block looks like underneath. <laughs> ah, Rachel says, we did that with some straw boaters for a stage musical where the chorus needed to do choreography with the hats and the stiffness was a desirable quality. Yes, I can imagine if you needed to fling a hat off stage that you do want it to kind of be frisbee-like. <laughs> but that is not what I was going for. So never mind. That that particular cartwheel hat was resigned to the failed hats box. Anyway, back to the puzzle block. This is a puzzle block. Um, this is what it looks like on the inside. Again, sorry about the cling film. So it's made. This one is made out of five pieces. So you've got this central piece which um, has these tabs in it. And then you've got these two outer pieces right here. And then you've got the front and back pieces here. And in fact, one is labeled back over here. And this is an X for where the front is. And when we take it apart, you'll notice that it's also labeled on the inside. The previous owner of this block was very diligent in making sure that they knew how it should go together and I'm very grateful for that and we'll see why that's a really important thing to do when we take this off the block. But you might be asking, why do you need... <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, you might be asking, why do you need a block to be able to be taken apart? Well. If I turn this over, pop it back on the spinner. We went over the difference between spinners and block stands last week, but this is this is a spinner, so it's a short stubby thing that holds holds the block. If you look at the shape of this hat or this block, it goes further out up here and then it goes in at the head size. If this was a normal hat block without a puzzle block, you would really struggle getting this off. In fact, let me show you. So if I pull the pins out, this has got two, two cords on it. Second pin, and then I'll take the cords off. Now, of course, I don't really want to be taking it off the block without marking the front and back. So actually, let's quickly do that. Uh, so we can see where the back is and the front is and sometimes you can mark it with something um, like with some soap or some Taylor's chalk. I can't get Taylor's chalk to work for me. I don't know why. I just can't seem to get it to mark things. Maybe it's because my Taylor's chalk is just ages old from my mum's sewing box and so it just dried up and doesn't work. I don't know. So I tend to use soap but in the case of hats I'm actually just going to use some pins and just where the back is I'm going to pop a pin in 
Oh, um, sorry, Evelyn, yes, I forgot to answer your question about the damp cloth uh, when you were pressing, uh, Evelyn said earlier, uh, so a question about could I have shrunk the cape clean, um, the, the head size of the cape clean with an iron? I think you probably could, but you are in danger of burning the felt and leaving like burn marks from the iron. I don't know if you've ever left a pair of hair straighteners on a carpet before, but I have, and it does, it does burn away. So you don't want to be doing that. Anything hot on the, any direct heat on the felt will potentially cause burn scorching marks. So if you do want to try that, you can either put a piece of baking paper or a tea towel or like a pressing cloth or something in between the two. But um, I would, but honestly, I, cake cleans are so easy to buy, at least in the UK, that I would just put that one aside that's too wide at the head, use it for something else, make, make some small callow half hats out of it, which maybe we'll do in another stream. Um, and just buy another cape clean and just try again. That's, and in fact, that's what I will do. I will put an order in for some cape cleans and maybe we'll go back to blocking with this block. <laughs> right. That's my back pin in. Here is going to be my front pin where this crosses. So that's just going through the felt. Just making sure I can, whoops, get that in. Has that gone through? There it is, right. So if I pop it back on the spinner now, Uh, Shari says, can you bake the felt down in an oven on a cooler setting? I would be a bit scared to do that. I cook a lot in my oven, so I don't really want to, um, I don't, I don't really think I want to try and, and do that. Um, it, but by all means, if, if you think that's going to work, you should experiment, obviously safely experiment. Um, so yeah. Uh, Wayne from the Haberdashery Project says a wet cloth over the felt is a great way to shrink and block It's an old method, but one that's important to know. Well, I've never tried it. So um, Maybe maybe if you say it works, then maybe maybe I will give it a go um, So yeah, I don't know I'm not convinced just because it takes time and I'm very impatient So I'd rather save something and just start again. It's sometimes easier rather than trying to salvage the ends. Um, let's get back to this block. So there's no way this is coming off just because the lip over here is so much smaller than the outer edges. There's, there's no way I can lift it off. No, absolutely no way. So if I start trying, I'm just going to ruin the shape of the hat and there's no point in doing that. Um, would you guys like to see how I blocked it? Because I did film it. <laughs> Before we unblock it, do you want to see how we blocked it? <laughs> should we, should we watch? Let's watch a video. Okay, I'm going to switch it to the video of how I blocked this and hopefully I can voice over it and um, hopefully the microphone works. Let's. Let's test it and see. I'm still trying new things. I'm still getting my head around all this technology. <laughs> uh, there we go. Guys, can you see all that? Is that working? So, uh, this is me steaming, um, steaming the hood, which was a merino wool felt. And here is me covering the puzzle block in cling film. That's the steamer, off it goes. Oh, here's me trying the towel trick. This time just with a small tea towel going over the top. And um, what am I doing here? Oh, I'm picking out some rubber bands and some blocking cords because I wasn't sure if I needed the blocking cord or um, if I could get away with a rubber band. I mean, spoiler alert, it turned out I could not get away with a rubber band and I did need the blocking cord. So this is me pushing and um, pulling. So the problem here with a shape like this is that you end up with that bump at the center top. As you can see, that's where I'm directing my steamer. And giving it that extra steam should make it pliable enough to keep pulling it down. 
But what I discovered is that eventually I did need to put the blocking cord on and kind of pull and push against the blocking cord while it was on the block already. So this, this didn't really do much. So yes, I'm holding it against my stomach and I'm trying to smooth it down, but as you can see, it's still a bit creased at the top. So this is, this is just me adding more steam. It just needed so much more steam. If this was a fur felt, I think this would have blocked a lot easier. But I don't know, I just, I don't really want to buy a lot of fur felts. They are a byproduct of the food industry, especially here in Europe. I'm not sure about um, the USA, but in Europe, in Central, um, not Central Europe, Eastern Europe, they eat a lot of rabbits, which is where the fur comes from. Um, but I don't know, I just, I'd prefer to use wool felt. I, I get that the, the rabbit felt feels nicer and it's warmer and all of that, but I don't know, just wool felt is, it just feels kinder. Right, this is me now using the blocking cord. So I pop the blocking cord on, there's two grooves in this block. There's, this is the top groove. And what I'm doing here is pulling the cord to my left and then pulling the wool felt down and then adding some more steam. And there we go. So, you, you know, sometimes when blocking it really feels like we could do with an extra pair of hands because I'm pulling down with one hand, pulling across with another hand, and then the block keeps moving, so I'm having to use my stomach to hold it in place, which is why I'm wearing a apron. There we go. I was clearly happy with it at this point, so I've put a pin in through both strands, and I've used a mini hammer here to hammer it in rather than a pin pusher. And then I'm giving it a brush. It's always good practice to just every now and again, brush your felt. This is a natural bristle brush. And the second blocking cord goes on. And that's me trying to find that bottom groove and trying to even it out. More steam. If you find that it's not pulling, it generally means that it's not hot enough or, or wet enough to pull. So you just need to add more steam and eventually it should it should pull into, into the shape you want it. And that's the beauty of felt. And one last brush. This is a curved natural bristle brush that I think you're supposed to use on brims. Um, but I decided that I could try and kind of, um, I don't know if you've ever iced a cake before, but you know when you put some um, uh, buttercream on top of like a Victoria sponge or something, and then you spin the cake spinner? This is kind of what I was going for over here. <laughs> I don't know, I, I think the smaller brush worked better. Oh, that's the end of the video. Welcome back. Did you guys enjoy that? <laughs> And then in true Blue Peter fashion, here's one I made earlier. <laughs> because of course, if I just blocked it right now, we wouldn't be able to unblock it straight away. You've got to leave it for, you know, at least 12 hours. I tend to leave it for 24 hours, if not longer, in a, um, I, I put them in my um, airing cupboard because that's a nice warm environment. And a trick to know, if your felt is dry, it's kind of like um, with plaster, if you have a plaster a wall, or you make a plaster cast of something, if you put it against your cheek and it feels cold, then it's still wet. But if you put it against your cheek and it feels room temperature, then it is dry enough to take off a block. But if in doubt, leave it for longer. It's not gonna hurt it being off the block. And in fact, actually, good practice like this is this is like essentially good practice millinery tip you shouldn't take something off a block unless you're ready to wire it or put it on a um like if you're doing a crown to brim join unless you're ready to do that straight away you shouldn't really take something off the block because it can start to warp and lose its shape so you do want to leave it on until you're ready to take it off not just when it's dry 
Oh, Rachel says, I have to pop out. Lunch is ready, but I'll stay in the chat in case you're still streaming when I'm done and I can pop back in then. Oh, it was lovely to have you, Rachel. Thanks for thanks for joining me. And um, I'm sure everyone really appreciates your wealth of knowledge that you've helped everyone in the comments today. <laughs> have a lovely lunch. <laughs> right. Shall we take this thing off the block and then we can talk a little bit about trimming it. Here we go. Right. I'm going to take it off the spinner. Now, I've only taken this block apart once when I first received it in the post. So I do know how it goes apart, but I'm slightly worried that I might not be able to pull it apart. So once again, um, I don't know what I'm going to do if this goes wrong. <laughs> well, I guess we'll just try. So I, I'm guessing I just need to kind of pull upwards. Oh, it's actually coming undone. Okay. Okay, it's actually coming. Here it goes. Okay, it's taking out the, ah, uh, ow. There we go, that's come out. Oh, I'm sorry, that might have been bad for the microphone, but here is the middle section. Here it is, so you can see these are the tabs that hold everything together. This is very intricate woodwork here. And it's got a few cracks in it. I think, I think um, in our last live stream, Rachel suggested that you can um, use oil like you would on a chopping board on blocks if they aren't varnished and this one isn't varnished. I think I might just oil it all over, condition that wood, keep it going. Because this is from at least the middle of the 20th century, if not earlier. It's actually stamped, you can see here, with a French, um, French address. 82 um, Rue de Clary. I'm very sorry about my French accent. I have to get into the French character to do the French accent and I haven't had time to do that today. Paris. Um, I might look up what this is now actually. That would be an interesting thing to do. I'll look it up later. Um, but this is the centre bit. As you can see, I was saying earlier that the sides will be labelled. So this is A, C, B and D. Put that to one side. And now you can see that the inside should come apart much easier. So there is one bit and the other bit. I'm, I'm very pleased with this block. <laughs> and here's the side bit. This is the big bit. I'm trying to not slam it down on the table. There we go. And then the last wooden bit got a bit of stiffener damage on it. Yes, I do. Um, I will be cleaning this block up. Maybe I'll do a video on that. I, yeah, I, I wanted to try it out first before doing anything to it, but I think it does need an oil. Maybe just a light sanding on the top. And then this, this was also part of the block. It's just a bit of felt. I'll go into why it's there in a second when we put the block together again. Oh, and then, oops. Get rid of the, um, cling film off the block. Here is the shape. Doesn't that look gorgeous? I'm very pleased with how it turned out. It's definitely stiff enough, so I don't need to add any extra stiffener to it. Let's pop this to one side and assemble the block back. Let's see, will it go back together? So this is the center bit. Uh, this is B, so can you see the inside is labeled as B and B, so I know that this goes on like this. Then, the other section goes on. Thank you, Shari. I'm sure that if you set up an eBay alert, then you'll be able to find this. I know there's some millinery exchange groups on Facebook where um, milliners will list some of their old blocks if they're retiring or sell them as job lots. Auction sites, um, local vintage fairs, sometimes you'll come across a block um, and that's how I came across this one completely by chance on a, on a Facebook exchange group from um, a milliner who was retiring who actually was one of my first millinery tutors. So I'm, I'm very pleased to have been able to purchase this block and to carry on using it in, in, um, in her place. I'm, I'm very grateful that I came across it. I'm quite attached to this block now. Um, okay. C, and C is on the inside here. Oh, whoopsie. Give me one second, guys. 
<laughs> that is... Whoops! That's the battery gone. I'll just change... I'll just quickly change the battery. Give me one second. What do you guys think of my top today? Do you like it? I haven't worn it for a while. Red stripes. Okay, I think, I think I'm back. Almost back, just popping the other battery to charge. Um, <laughs> do they ship internationally? I mean, it depends on um, who you contact. So it'll be, because because you're buying this from not a business, but like an individual, I mean, like a millinery business, but it, it's an individual person selling it to you. Um, they'll all say whether they will deliver to certain countries. Some people will, some people won't. It's just completely dependent. Um, yeah, so good luck everyone with finding blocks. You know, eBay has a function where you can set up a search alert. So that should, um, that should work quite well for these, these kind of things. In fact, I have an eBay alert set up for puzzle blocks. And um, I've got two actually. I've got this one and I have another one. And the other one I have is in a box in quarantine because I'm not sure if it's got a woodworm problem. And it's in a box in quarantine because you can only treat woodworm in the spring months, which we're coming up to. Um, and I want to make a video about treating it with the woodworm treatment and restoring it to its former glory because I think it's actually an Edwardian block and I, I have no idea what it's going to turn out looking like, but it's in quarantine and we'll get it out later. Uh, Shari says, if anyone is in Canada, I saw the same type of puzzle block on eBay. Ah, well, everyone, go, go, go. If you're in Canada, go and grab it. <laughs> grab it before it's gone. <laughs> Should we continue assembling the block? Right, um, I think I'm slightly going to struggle getting this piece in. I, might, I put it on the spinner because I thought, oh, that'll make it easier. But actually, I think it's made it a bit harder. So let's see. Did I put it in the wrong way? It's not quite wanting to... Okay, change of plan. Okay, the change of plan being this. This is... This is D, this is C. Let's take one of these off. And I'm actually going to put these sides on. Simultaneously, maybe. Let's see, okay, that fits, that fits. Let's see, will this fit now? There we go, okay, that fits. Which brings us on to this piece of felt. This piece of felt here. Why does it have this piece of felt? Well, you'll notice if I tilt this slightly, I don't wanna, oh, there we go. Can you see how this middle bit over here is sunk down into the inside of the block? Well, this is because um, with age, the wood will shrivel up and shrink a bit. And what tends to happen with puzzle blocks is the middle section seems to always dip down. So don't worry about it. That's totally normal. It's not going to impact the performance of the block because all you do is you get a piece of felt. Um, you might need two bits. You might need one bit. You might need a thinner bit, you know, layer it up. If, if the felt isn't too thick, then you can maybe use like some cotton wadding or something and tamp it down. But you just need to cut it the same size as the hole and pop it in. And now if I tip it to its side again, you'll see now it will be a smooth line. So that's puzzle blocks. Have you guys got any questions for me on the puzzle block before we talk about the berry? I see you're all having a lovely chat about where you can purchase these. Yes, eBay, Etsy, all the, all the online shops. Sometimes the jackpot is actually buying a block from someone who doesn't know what it is because then they're likely to underprice it. 
And actually, this is the problem with buying on eBay or Etsy. Actually, sometimes they're overpriced. So I know that we can all be a bit desperate in wanting to buy blocks, but you don't want to overpay either because that just, it's like those, um, like sometimes with technology, if you can't get hold of something, someone, someone else has bought it up and they're doubling or tripling the price. Similar things can happen with blocks and millinery equipment, which is really sad to see. And you don't want to exacerbate that business model because it's not okay. Blocks don't depreciate in value, but they also shouldn't increase in value either. Unless there's something really like collectible about them. Like maybe, maybe you find a block that's stamped Dior or Balenciaga on the bottom. And then yes, obviously that's going to be really expensive and with good reason but if it's just a block that has a local milliner's name on the bottom and you plan to use it as a milliner it should not be overpriced so have a look at how much a new block of that type costs and compare it to the vintage block price and if the vintage block price is set more contact the seller and say look i can buy this new at this price this is old, it should be at least the same price, if not less, unless it's something extra special. <laughs> Jackie Kennedy's hat block worth three dollar signs. I don't actually, have, have you seen a Jackie Kennedy hat block go, go, um, go up for auction? I actually made a video where I um, recreated Jackie Kennedy's hat from her inauguration and I made the block um, the, the same shape out of plaster for it so um, hopefully I'll remember to link that somewhere in a playlist or a description or just you know attach it somewhere on this video so you can go and have a look at how I'm doing that. Trina says I'm planning to commission a woodworker to make a block for me have you tried designing your own blocks? No I haven't um, because it's expensive and I don't like to spend money unless I have a really good reason for it. Ah, oh, thanks. There we go. That's Matthew posting the Jackie Kennedy video in the chat there. Thank you, Matthew. Um, back to the question. Designing my own blocks. I feel like because I've only been doing this for four years, I think, and I don't have a lot of space, I don't want to be accumulating a lot of stuff that might not recuperate its cost so if i'm trying to create a hat that has a like fantastical shape that i don't have anything of that shape i'm more likely to try and make it myself in 3d there's different methods you can do you can use um, reinforced strips of buckram with some wire in fact um husband can you from the millinery cupboard bring me there's a bandeau hat shape that's covered in cling film and white um white cotton wadding if you could bring that for me that would be great i'll show everyone what i'm talking about um so you can make your own blocks um and then if you've got the budget once you've made your block you can take that block to the woodworker and then they can copy it for you. And in fact, it's going to be much easier for the woodworker block maker to make you a block if, if you bring them a 3D model of what you want. So, aha, thank you very much. So this is, this is a type of handmade block. I made this on a course, which actually I highly recommend. Um, I'll talk about that course in one second. Uh, so I try to focus on cosplay and things like that. So this info is interesting. Yes. So if you're focusing on cosplay, I don't know if you'd be... So the point of a block is to be able to commercially remake the same shape over and over again. But I'm guessing for cosplay, you're likely to make one shape and then continue um, and, and then kind of potentially not make it again unless you absolutely have to. Um, but this is where making your own blocks comes in. So this is a type of self-made block. This is on a wire frame using a material called foss shape over the top. There's several layers of wire and there's several layers of foss shape. And then there's also several layers of buckram in this. I made this on a course with a milliner called Sarah Lomax. Um, she did a course on using foss shape over a wired block. So if you want to learn how to do that, I'm not going to do a tutorial on that. Go and find Sarah, she does the course online. 
um, and maybe I'll even link it in the description box below. Um, I don't know if it's a continuous course that's running all the time, but you can probably sign up to emails and she'll update you when it's on. But I highly recommend going and learning about this. Um, I can tell you a little bit about Foss Shape. So Foss Shape is, I mean, here it just looks like white, um, like just something white and it's, it's not as hard as wood. So that's wood and that's this Foss Shape. Um, what is Foss Shape? It's a kind of a plasticky felt material that when you heat it, it keeps its shape and if you reheat it, it won't mold any other way. So there's another material called EVA foam, which will, I think, continue to be able to be reshaped every time you heat it. Um, so you, you can't really use EVA foam for a block, but you can use this foss shape stuff. Um, I have heard of people using it for actual hat block, um, hat um, bases. Um, I mean, obviously, everyone can do what they want. Personally, I wouldn't use it on a base because it does contain plastic and I try and keep my plastic consumption at the lowest possible. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it on an actual hat base, but making a block out of it, I think is a pretty good idea. It's quite a nifty material in that sense with that special property of holding its shape once it's been heated. So that's an option for your own block. And once you make something like this, you can take this to a block maker and they'll just be able to clone it for you in wood. Um, the other thing you can do is use um, polyurethane foam. So if you have a shape you want to clone, you can mix up this two-part PU foam and it, it's that expandable foam stuff that they use in windows. And you can fill a shape with it and it will take on the shape. I have a couple of videos on that. And then also there's the plaster block version where you can make a wire shape and cover it in um, uh, in you make the wire shape and then you cover it in the plaster. I've also that that's how I made the Jackie Kennedy hat. Um, I'm planning to use EVA for a hat base, and I've done blocks for cinema things. Um, yeah, if that's if that's easier for you, then yeah, totally, that will definitely work. I hope it works for you. <laughs> I've never done that myself. Um, right, shall we? Quick sip of tea. Ooh, I'm talking too much. So, this was the puzzle block. I'm gonna set it to one side. Obviously, continue asking me questions about puzzle blocks, if you have any. But now let's talk about the berry. So, it's got this skirt on it and it's got this top. And then it's got this lip. Oh, switch the camera view. There we go. Can you put pins into the foss shaped block? Yes, okay, let me just quickly show you that. That's exactly why it's a really good material. So here's a pin, here's the foss shape. Whoop, there it is. You can see it on the underside and the other side. Um, it's not very easy to block on because obviously it's got the wire frame. So look, I can move it around. So this is really good for cinema and buckram, but I probably wouldn't, um, it would be difficult to stretch felt over it. I have actually stretched felt on it. Uh, this cactus headdress is flat, so no much, not much problem to cut and shape. Oh, if you're just doing a flat shape, then you don't necessarily need a block. You can use a um, poupe head to do a, a kind of semi-flat shape on. And actually, I should have prepped my um, poupe head, Anne. Um, husband, could you come and help get a few things for me? Can you find, in the corridor, there is a burgundy hat with a veiling stretched over it. That's in the corridor. And then come and get something for me here in this room. <laughs> show and tell today. I think last time we had a bit of a show and tell session as well. Um, just wait for my husband to bring me that hat. And now could you also pass me Anne, just to walk in front of the camera. No, you're fine, you're fine, because I switched the camera view. 
I need um I didn't prep correctly, did I? <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, we'll talk about Anne the Poofe head in a second. Um, this is the shape that I blocked on this block. So there you go. So it's it's possible, it just takes a bit of work to get the, um, so on this one, the corners are turned in, so it took it took some work to bend them in and make sure there's no creases on the inside. But yeah, you'll, you'll find it much easier to block lighter materials on this, so maybe even straw, because straw doesn't really stretch, it just keeps the weave and moulds around it. So, that's DIY blocks. Do you guys want more information on DIY blocks? Is that is that something that you'd want me to maybe do a, a stream on? Just show and tell of DIY blocks. Maybe that's a nice, nice idea. Um, so, this is Anne. This is my poopy head. Who, uh, I've currently blocked a cinema, um, what are these things called? Like a button thing. Just blocked it flat. So I'm going to take it off because I'm going to use Anne to balance the baryon. Take that off. Uh, should I take the cling film off? Oh, I might as well leave the cling film on. But essentially, this is how the beret is going to sit. I mean, obviously this skirt needs taking off. Here it is. I think that's gonna look pretty lovely, but uh, we need to trim the skirt and then we need to figure out a trim for it. Ah, there seems to be a lot of um, demand for DIY blocks. Uh... <laughs> to, yeah, okay, Matthew, if you could make a note for me that maybe, maybe next stream, so we probably won't do a stream again next week because I do want to release a video. So not next week and maybe the week after, maybe the week after that, I'll keep you guys updated, but next stream, let's do a DIY show and tell of um, uh, DIY blocks even. Let's do that. <laughs> Probably won't be a two hour stream at that point, just a short one hour show and tell. Next stream. <laughs> right, we must concentrate. I'm getting off track very easily. So. This lip over here. So obviously you can see, can you see? <laughs> It's got some markings from the um, knots in the blocking cord. I don't know how to get rid of these. Um, I haven't figured it out yet. I'm sure there must be a way. Maybe I sh shouldn't knot it like this. Maybe there's a different way of knotting blocking cords. But never mind. Um, you could potentially cover this in a ribbon or the other thing that you would normally do, I think, with a berry block is, uh, with a berry shape, is you could just tuck that bit underneath like that so the lip ends up standing away from this outside edge um let's experiment with that so i need to cut this off now i like to use just my fabric scissors on it i mean if i had more space maybe i'd just have a designated pair of felt scissors and what do I, how do I want to do this? Right, I, I wouldn't recommend cutting, so if these are my scissors, I wouldn't recommend cutting up the felt because you never know what you can use this for and sometimes you might want to have a continuous bit of spiral felt for something, just a trim or anything. So I'm going to make an incision here and then cut along this line. And do I have something to make an incision with? Yes, I do. There we go, just a standard craft knife and obviously keeping my other hand away so that I don't injure myself. And I'm going to cut along the top edge of this. Just do a small enough incision that I can get my scissors in and then use my scissors. You can use the craft knife all the way around, but sometimes I found that the craft knife is so sharp that it's very easy to ruin the shape of the hat. 
So let's cut along there. Trying to keep a nice clean edge going all the way around. Oh, I've already... Okay, avoid that pin. I'm going to repin that pin. It pays off taking your time of trimming edges because it's much easier to get it right first time than to try and re-trim it. I'm going very slowly. I hope you guys can see it. Keeping my scissors nice and straight and steady. And I'm never snipping the scissors to the edge. So I'm going to about here and then reopening. So not snipping, just, just enough in this kind of motion. And then of course, I'm cutting straight like this, but sometimes you might want to cut on an angle, so you'd flip your scissors this way. And by on an angle, I mean the edge of the felt will be on an angle. And sometimes that's advantageous if you're flipping a brim under, because that gives you a diagonal edge and you can have a seamless join, which is pretty cool. Oh, I'm up to the second pin. Just going to repin that. Oh, that's not quite central. There it is. Does anybody have any questions on scissors? You've all gone quiet in the chat. I know it seems like I'm going really slowly, but honestly, I have learnt my lesson in trying to cut things off fast. I now take my time with the scissors. There we go. That's off. So, now I've got this skirt bit as one piece, which I can use to make various decorations out of. So I'll pop that to one side and we can discuss some trims. This is the berry. Doesn't it look lovely? I actually think it suits this colour. When I was blocking, I did think that it wasn't going to look too nice, but shall I try it on? Do I have preferred scissor brands? I do, yes. Um, if you can afford it, I've heard that Friscus is a good brand, and these are my, oh, change the camera back. Uh, these are my normal sewing scissors. Uh, this is Friscus brand. I really like these. They've got a very sharp end. These are good for just when you're hand sewing. But for general purpose fabric scissors, if you can afford it, I mean Friscus is great. You can even get scissors that have a, um, like an automatic, I don't know what it's called, when they automatically keep this, like they have a spring in them or something and they keep this, so your only action is to go in rather than out so you're not straining your muscles so much it's great for seamstresses if you're having to cut out like 10 circle skirts in a day which i have had to do before for a dance thing but thankfully i don't have to do that anymore and so my hand doesn't hurt as much but these are pretty good these are from ikea ikea i love these so much and i sharpen them myself as well um good to keep them really sharp uh let's have a look at some more questions change to this. Uh, not a question, but a statement. I grew up in a family of textile manufacturers, so I'm always making sure I cut fabrics with fabric scissors. Yes, very important, super important. And you want to keep them sharp as well. So um, I think back in the day, in the UK, um, if you were living on like a, a, like a suburban street, you'd have a, a man with a van come round every now and again who would sharpen your scissors and knives. Um, I don't live in an area where that happens and I'm very sad about that because I would love to get all of my scissors sharp and not just the sewing ones. Um, but for now, shall I show you a trick on how I sharpen them myself? Like this isn't, this isn't the best thing to do, but it'll do in a pinch. Do you guys want to see it? I'll show you. <laughs> I know my mum tried to do this and she couldn't figure it out when I showed her, but let me try and show you guys 
and see if you can get it. Um, I'm not going to do it on my fabric scissors. Right. These are just normal kitchen scissors. And this is a pin. Let's see if I can zoom in. Can I zoom in? Yay. Let's focus that. There we go. Right. Here's the sharpening trick. Um, if anyone asks you, I didn't tell you to do this. You have a pin and you have your scissors and the motion is going to be just to kind of open like this. In fact, I'll just show you with my hands first. So if this is the pin and these are the scissors, the motion is to push against the pin like this, against the inside of both with equal pressure. So, oops going in one direction only. So I'm holding the pin, I hold the scissors and I go like this. And obviously I don't want to stop and like close the scissors on the pin because that will blunt them. So it's very easy to blunt your scissors while sharpening them. But if you just keep steady pressure and just keep doing this, it will eventually sharpen enough. You only need to do it like three or four times a go and then they'll be sharp enough to use for the next couple of cuts and then you can do it again and again and again. So that's what I do to the kitchen scissors. I'm a bit scared to try that on, on my fabric scissors. I've never done that on my fabric scissors. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how sharp that would keep the fabric scissors because it could blunt them. Um, but yes, there we go. Um, but if anyone asks, I didn't tell you about it. <laughs> yes, looks scary, it does. Please, sharp objects, pens, just make sure that you are safe. Um, if you don't want to try it, don't try it if you don't feel safe. Uh, Sandra says, we have a professional scissor knife sharpener in the next village, I'm so excited, uh, I'm so happy about that. And the scissors are sharp for a long time. Yes, I, I wish we had that still in in the UK. Um, I know there used to be a knife sharpening service somewhere in central London where all the fabric shops are, but I think they closed down and retired. So all these kind of specialist businesses, they're not, um, they're not really around anymore. I'm just gonna pop my glasses on because my eyes are getting a bit tired. Right, we've got, uh, I think 20 minutes left of the stream. So shall I try the hat on? Let's try the hat on. So, there's several ways I could wear this. I could wear it like this. So this is with this lip. And actually with my hair being so puffy, I was worried it was gonna be too big for me. But actually I think with my hair being quite so puffy, it's the right size. <laughs> my hair bulks out the head size. Um, so this is one way, if I turn to the side. It's got this, and I'm thinking that for a trim, I could just put something on the side, or I could put a ribbon around it. Um, there we go. Um, or, here's maybe what I will do with this particular one, is because we've got this lip, let's switch camera views. Just because we've got this lip, I would be tempted to fold it in underneath like this. Let's refocus that camera. There we go, right. Fold it in underneath because I actually think it will look a bit better. And it's obviously not gonna hold its shape without any stitching and it's gonna start losing its shape. So maybe I won't play around with it too much because I don't have time to stitch it all down. Oh, husband, could you come and change the camera battery for the front facing camera? While we're talking about these kind of trims here. So, um, I was wondering whether this would need a wire or not. Um, and I think it does actually, because look, it's just really, really floppy. Um, look at that, it's just going everywhere. So I think I will put a wire in it. Or maybe it will just be enough with a head size ribbon. Um, oh, let's read. Let's read some chat. Um, that reminds me of sucrose from Genshin Impact, especially with your hair. Don't fold it in. I love the height. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I might just try and make a second one with the height. Maybe I should keep the height and make it in red. I think that would look really nice. And um, Shari says I was imagining a ribbon around it. It looks like one of my favorite vintage hats ever. 
Um, yes, it does look very vintagey. In fact, I've also got a piece of ribbon that might suit this. Once husband's done with that camera, he could pass me my ribbon. <laughs> Give us a second, everybody, <laughs> while we... Um, the ribbon is just there, that stripy one. Yay, stripy ribbon. Here it is. Isn't this pretty? Look at this. This is from one of my favourite millinery suppliers. I bought it for another hat, but I think it doesn't suit it. Um, if you have, if you use a wire, where would you place it and what type of, type of wire would you use? That's a very good question. Let's discuss it once I finish gushing about this ribbon. How lovely does this ribbon look? And it's double sided, so you can go any way you want. So I can have these stripes facing upwards or facing downwards. I think that's pretty nice. And obviously it's Petersham, and because it's got a curve, I would have to curve it round. But this is what it would look like from a distance. I'll show you it in the front camera. There it is. That's pretty. Um, right, shall we answer the wire question? So, um, there is no right or wrong way to answer that. Uh, if I wanted to keep this lip standing up, I would potentially pop the wire in the, onto the outside edge using a wire stitch. And then let's pretend this isn't stripy. Let's just pretend it's a normal Petersham ribbon, just one color. I would then fold it uh, in half and conceal that edge wire with the ribbon like this. And I don't think that would take away from the look of the hat. Um, so if you found a ribbon that matched exactly, so if I found a ribbon in this sand color, or if, if I had a red hat, which I'm really feeling the need for red today, hence the red stripes. Maybe I should have blocked this berry in red to begin with. Um, using a red ribbon on the red felt, that would conceal an edge, um, an edge there. Um, the other place to put the wire would be on this inside bit, so you can see on the outside that's where the fold is, this is where the blocking cord was. So it would go right in there, and I know it's equal all the way around so it would be super easy to put in. And then I'd stitch it in using a wire stitch, and obviously making invisible stitches on the outside because it's felt, and then I probably wouldn't bother putting a ribbon on the outside. And then I'd fold that edge in and stitch the edge down. I hope that answers your question. Um, the next question, uh, Sandra says, would it stretch out over time without any wire or ribbon so it needs something to finish it up? Yes, um, all hat materials will do that. So if you're wondering why, for example, on a hat like this, switch cameras again. There we go. On a hat like this, this is a trilby with a bucket brim. There is a video on this coming, hopefully next week, if everything works. <laughs> um, this will need a head size ribbon on the inside because these kind of hats don't tend to have a wire along the head edge. And so it's the ribbon that holds the shape and it's got to be the right kind of ribbon. It has to be a millinery Petersham, which is made out of natural fibers because you need it to be able to curve. But we'll talk about that in this video, so I'm not going to discuss that now. Otherwise we'll run out of time and we won't have decided on any trims. Um, then you've got hats like this, where potentially you could put the wire in the edge here, because this will also warp over time. I haven't in this hat. Um, so, oh, hi Rachel, back from lunch. Um, and anyone else who's joined us recently, um, we're just talking about the need for wires in various hats. So in this cinema one, this is a bias brim edge, which there is a video coming on this as well. And we can talk about um, wires in this video. So I'm not going to talk about this particular hat now. We are talking about this hat with the wires. So you could skip the wire and just use the ribbon. I'm just used to putting wires in everything because I tend to make pill boxes. Let me get a pill box. So I've got these two pill boxes here. This pill box has a wire in it. Uh, let's change cameras. 
Can you guys see that wire? There it is. And this is the edge, which I haven't actually stitched down. So sometimes you can stitch the edge down, sometimes just folding it over is enough. It depends on, on what you want to achieve. But this is a pillbox with a wire inside the folded edge, which is probably what I might end up doing on this hat. Or you have pillboxes like this where there is no edge to fold under. This is a fabric covered buckram pillbox. And because there is no edge to fold under, it is wired just here on the edge. And you obviously can't see the wire because it's hidden with the fabric. So that's how I, I'm used to doing things because I make a lot of pillboxes. I'm essentially, I'm, I'm known for pillboxes and half hats. That's pretty much what I do. Um, I don't tend to normally make things with brims, so I'm not, I'm not the best person to ask um, that kind of uh, thing about brims and things, but yeah, uh, with berets. I've never made a beret before, this is my first blocked beret, so it's, it's going to be interesting to see what I end up doing with it, I'm not sure yet. I think I'm leaning towards you see, I feel like putting in a wire because that's what I'm always doing. But at the same time, maybe I should just not put a wire in and just see if a ribbon is enough. Just like with a head fitting hat, uh, with a brim, like a crown to brim join hat. Maybe I'll just do that. But I think on this one, I will fold the edge in just because I think it looks a little flimsy, this, this lip over here. Um, I might try and make another one that's red and leave myself enough to kind of fold the lip in twice. That might be that might be a way to solve that. Um, so yes, I think I'll fold it in, put in a ribbon, and then if it still feels a bit not sturdy enough, then I'll just pop a wire in. Should we talk trims? Uh, do you guys want to see what I have been trying out? This was one idea that I had. Look at this. This is a felt kind of leaf feather thing. It's a bit flimsy, but that's okay. Um, I could wire it to make it um, more shapeable. I'm going to switch cameras again. Let's pop this beret on Anne, and Anne can be our model for the day. Um, I'm gonna leave the lip on it for now. But here she is. Oh, that looks really nice. But my thinking was, right, let's see if I can coordinate this, is maybe something like this, where it kind of stands over the top. What do you guys think? Is this too much? Maybe it's too big. Or maybe it's too red. Maybe I should make the feather in in this sand colour, which was the same as as this. The other thing I was thinking, I do quite like this effect on the feather, but maybe the feather is too big, and so I tried to play around with some paper trim. So this is a good trick. If you don't know how you want to trim and you don't want to waste any materials, then you want to try and make things out of paper, and with felt, with felt trims that's really easy to mop them up in some paper. And so I was thinking like I could do something like this around the edge, but it's not, it's not my most favorite option, but it's an option. Or I could, um, maybe I'll just break that in half and twizzle it round. And then just like a little, a little something on the side, just a little extra flare or just park the feather idea completely and um, maybe in like blue or a matching ribbon, just a simple bow. So I won't go over bows today, but something, just a sweet little bow and maybe a button on the inside of the bow. That could be fun. <laughs> I don't know, I'm still thinking. What else have I got? Oh, some velvet ribbon. So sometimes adding texture is fun. So maybe instead of Petersham, I could go with a velvet textured ribbon. Let me show you the difference between the two. So this is the Petersham texture. So it's got the, the way it's made is it's got the threads kind of weaving 
up and down, well, side to side, up and down. Well, I think you understand what I mean. And then this is the velvet, which has a nap, which is obviously nice and soft. And the bow in this would look... I'm not the best at bows, but I'm going to try and do this. Something like this. That could look, that could actually look very festive if I pop this on, onto Anne. There we go. Oh, that looks really nice. And maybe even with, um, with the ribbon trailing down. Whoops. Running off Anne. So there we go. Um, Sherry says, could you make a pucker at the front lip, giving it a sort of cap look at the front? Would that add structure without compromising the whole thing? Do you mean like crease into the side? So um, like, like this? Um, it does completely change the shape. So if that's what you were asking, this is what, I, d I don't know if I've understood your question, but this is what it would look like. It does completely change the shape, so I wouldn't do that. After going through all that trouble of blocking on the puzzle block, I don't really want to play with the shape. You could, of course, do that as you're blocking on the puzzle block. You could add some folds in it. That would be an interesting thing to try, wouldn't it? Um, like you could, um, I think the technique is called veining. So if you were blocking on something like this, just a, um, What's this called? A poupe head. Then you can pinch felt together like this and it will create veins. You could do the same on the berry, of course. Uh, Sandra says, red ribbon or red feather both look great. I'm still in love with the feather. Do you guys want a very quick five minute demonstration on how to make this feather? So maybe we won't make any decisions on the trim, but I could show you guys how to make the felt feather. Do you guys want to know? It's super easy. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, isn't that pretty? Look, I've twisted it. Look at that. That's something. <laughs> Shari says feather in capital letters. Okay, so I'm going to show you in paper, but it's going to be the same in the felt. Oh, let's refocus. Okay, this is gonna be the last thing I show you and then we're gonna end the stream. Otherwise we'll be here for a very, very, very long time. Right, this is what my mock-up looked like in paper. So I'm just going to grab some paper. And I'm also going to grab some scissors and a pencil. Um, so what you want to do is just fold your paper in half somewhere. This is going to kind of give you a pattern. Um, and everything I'm doing with the paper is exactly the same how you do it with felt. And draw on a shape that you like. So you can, you can give it a leg or you can not give it a leg, doesn't matter. But give yourself some amount of distance from the side. It will just make it easier for when we come to cutting it. And then just sketch out some kind of shape that you like. So any shape you like. So I've got it bulging here. You could, um, let me show you on the other side, some other shapes you could do. Just as long as you've given yourself some space there. Uh, I could go up and give it a bit of a bulge at the top like that instead. That will give you a slightly different shape. Um, but for the one that I've shown you, it kind of bulges there. And actually, I think I've done too much of a bulge. Uh, this is too curved. I'm just going to even it out like this. There we go. And then what I would do is, oh, Rachel says, I did a video comparing this technique in wool felt, fur felt, and synthetic felt. You mean the feather or adding in um, the veining technique? Um, right, cut this out. I'm gonna cut it out with the leg because we can always take it off later.
here it is cut out and if I open it up it's it's rather giant this but you can play with the size because it's paper you're not worrying about wasting things ah Rachel maybe that's a video you could share for everyone to see um, I mean I'm giving a quick demonstration here but I mean if, if you've gone into a lot of detail that's probably a lot more helpful um, but essentially once you've got your shape and you're happy with the outside shape you want to start cutting in and the way I've done it is I've cut in at an angle so I've got this diagonal here and then I just follow that diagonal with my scissors not cutting all the way through to the edge so if I just draw on with the pencil you'll be able to see a bit better this is where I'm cutting to so if I just draw a straight line oops. I'm not going to cut past this line I'm just cutting in and then you can decide on if you want thick strands of feather or thin strands so this one I've done quite thin so let me do a thick one so you can see the difference so these are about one centimeter maybe seven millimeter wide obviously the thinner you go the less structurally sound your feather will be and what you want to do is keep that angle going so as I'm working my way up the feather I'm just going to increase the angle a bit just ever so slightly you see so over here this is this is this kind of angle here it's very small but then at the start my angle was like this and I've curved the angle in and once again this is just how I do it I mean once you experiment you'll find your ways of doing it which are you know every way as long as it looks how you want it to look then it's fine okay I've just drawn another pencil line in here this is actually how I've cut here so ignore this one it's this thinner one that's where I've cut to and if I open it up there it is this is how the thicker one looks, so you can see here. I think that looks actually very contemporary, it kind of looks a bit, um, what was the name of that painter? Matisse, Henri Matisse, who did all the cutout shapes, it looks a bit like that. And then you've got this one which looks more like a feather. And it actually reminds me of um, <laughs> like Soviet Christmas tree decorations, <laughs> that's what it reminds me of. Anyway, um, this is thin, this is thick, and I'd actually say that this one in felt is something in between. You can see here. It's obviously much more difficult to cut into the felt than it is into paper. Um, Sandra says, can you curl or manipulate the cut ends with heat or something? Uh, yes, you can. So, with um, a feather like this, what you can do is you'd, you'd have your steamer set up and then you'd probably want a set of pliers which i'm just trying to get out there it is a set of pliers like this or um some tweezers some really long tweezers and if you curl around your plier or your tweezer like this and hold it in front of the steam and then take it away it'll take you a very long time uh, because you've got to let it um cool before you can take your pliers away and then it will hold the curl like that that could be very interesting actually that's a very interesting technique to try um, but what I like about the feathers is that you can do this kind of thing with them I just think that looks really interesting I don't know what to do with it I just like how it looks <laughs> anyway which which feather do you guys like do you like the thin medium or thicker feather Maybe I should just play with this one a bit to see how it looks. Mm. Yeah, I'm not a fan of this one, although it's kind of sl when it's slightly curved like this, just a slight curve, that, that's also quite interesting. Of course, what you can do is not only curl the strands, 
but you could actually curl the feather. So I would put a wire in it if you wanted to do that. So if I wanted it to hold this kind of twisty shape, I would stitch a wire to it and kind of position it on the hat so the wire is behind it. Or you could cover the wire in um, in some ribbon. I mean, this doesn't match, but a felt ribbon or a petersham. I think the felt, uh, sorry, not felt ribbon, velvet ribbon. I think the velvet ribbon matches the kind of feel and texture of the felt, so that could hide it pretty well if you could find the exact match of colour. Anyway, I think that's everything. I mean, it's been two hours. Have you guys got any more questions for me? Three minutes of some questions while I take a cup of tea. Shari says, I like any of the shapes with a twist. I do as well. It is quite nice. It's quite interesting. And that's what this, this was as well. So this is the same technique as the feather, but it's just straight. It's just a rectangle that I've cut into, which you can twist. And I think that's quite fun as well. Did you guys enjoy today's stream? I'm sorry for all the things that went wrong. The block went wrong. Um... <laughs> the, the brim block went wrong. Oh well. Something to do next time. Oh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Michael. I'm very happy to have all your support. <laughs> um, Wayne asks, what's your favourite material... Uh, work on and what are the best materials for beginners? Um, it depends for what. I, I'm i always going to be a fan of buckram because I think it's just it's very easy to it's very cheap and if you mess something up it doesn't feel like it's the end of the world whereas with a felt hood if you make a hat and it goes wrong I think uh, at least for me I always kind of felt very sad about that because you know I've spent this money on this on this organic material and it's it's all gone wrong and now I don't know what to do with it but buckram just always felt a bit more like um, theatrical and experimentable um, but it depends on what you want to do um, so for beginners try uh, for beginners this is this is what I recommend for beginners I would say there's uh, four parts to millinery there's your felt then there's your buckram then there's cinnamon and then there's straw and they all have different properties so if you could find a course that will let you explore a little bit of each um oh and quite right also trinia eva uh, foam yes thermoplastics that's a fifth millinery material so if you could find a course that lets you experiment with at least a few of these materials um, then on that course you'll, you know, there'll, there'll be a teacher there to hold your hand and guide you and tell you what to do and then you won't feel so lost. Um, so yes, I recommend, I, I do recommend finding that. Um, I am also available as an online millinery teacher so if you would like a online class through Zoom with me, do get in touch and um, as I say, my speciality is buckram. So if you're looking at fabric covered buckram hats, and you'd like a one-to-one -one lesson, get in touch. Um, we can we can have a chat then about it. Right, I think, I think we'll leave it there for today. Thank you for joining me, everybody. Um, it's been it's been a pleasure to have you here to chat away with me while I try at things. Um, uh, what did I say we'll do next stream? I did already plan something for next stream. Oh, a DIY block show and tell. So um, that'll be next stream. My next video will be... Oh. Smooth transition. Will be this hat, how I made it, what it is, why it's so shiny, why it's so fuzzy. So if you don't want to miss that, please consider subscribing. Oops. Maybe I should say that actually looking at the camera. <laughs> so yeah, if you don't want to miss my videos, please consider subscribing. I do try and post once a week. If I don't post a video, then it will be a live stream. If it's not a live stream, it will be a video. You can follow me on Instagram at Violona Millinery. And here on YouTube, we have a lovely community of millinery people. So if you'd like to get in touch with them or find them, I will leave a list 
of their channels in the description box for this video. Um, and a couple of them were here today. We had SH Millinery in the chat earlier, we've got the Haberdashery Project, and we've got Le Bricoloose. Um, once again, thank you so much for watching. I hope you had a great time. I hope you've learned something new. I've certainly learned new things. Thank you. <laughs> See you next time. Bye.